G'day mate, Luke Ford here. I'm talking to Matthew. He's a history PhD student at London School of Economics. He uses the moniker on social media of History Speaks. He's on YouTube, he's on Rumble, he's on Twitter. And uh, Matt, talk to me about the direction of your online posting since October 7. Well, before 7 October, a lot of my content was devoted to debunking Holocaust denial, which was a subject that I didn't have any particular passion for um, beforehand, the Nazi Holocaust, but I just got into because I thought I'm kind of into right-wing spheres online. I thought, wow, they're really getting this wrong. The far right, this is dumb, meaning Holocaust denial. So I kind of got obsessed with debunking it and ended up getting a lot of Jewish fans. But uh, since 7th October, although I, I certainly condemned from the beginning the Hamas uh, attack, I've been advocating on behalf of, of Palestinians against Israeli war crimes um, and uh, for a, ce a ceasefire conditional to the release of the hostages and other factors. Yeah, I mean, I, I've never seen you this passionate about uh, current events before on your social media. Is that fair? Yeah, fair. About uh, current events before. On and is there anything that you've learned because i'll admit like everything that is happening in this israel versus hamas conflict just seems to confirm my prejudices about how the world works anything that has surprised you um i was uh, surprised by how uh, brutal hamas was um i i knew they were a terrorist group i didn't have illusions about their willingness to kill civilians but the level of brutality did, did surprise me and I think uh, subsequently the openness with which Israeli officials have engaged in, in uh, murderous or even in, in some cases genocidal rhetoric has uh, surprised me as well, even though I, I knew they had no love for the Palestinians. And have you, have you learned anything from all your interactions online about this conflict? I have. I think that a number of people um, are operating on a very identity politics driven who have deprecated identity politics like Gad Saad, Nathan Kopnis are actually, Nathan, Ben Shapiro are actually um, very much plugged into the identity politics uh, software and have made arguments that uh, may be emotionally understandable um, uh, given the horror of 7 October, but are so uh, flabby and unrigorous that uh, they'd never make it in other contexts, but for their identity concerns. So it's important to you to be rigorous in addition to being passionate. Is that fair? Yeah. Um, so I believe uh, that, and this is just from my engagement with relativists like uh, Foucault, I believe that in some sense, objectivity is a, is a myth. But because we have biases and our biases will inform the narratives we construct. But I also believe that we can care about factual accuracy, right? I, I think that whether our analysis will always be biased at the margins, uh, whether our politics will always intrude in our analysis, maybe so, but we can still be committed to factual accuracy and analytical rigor in a way I think many people have, have failed um, uh, the last uh, several weeks. Are there any commentators, historians that you admire with regard to this conflict between Israel and its neighbors? Uh, definitely. Um, um, so in terms of, uh, uh, and this I think informs, my, uh, uh, bolsters my last point. Um, uh, this I think bo bolsters my um, last point about how politics isn't always a guide uh, to analytical rigor. Uh, I think Benny Morris's um, Righteous Victims remains the best comprehensive treatment of this uh, crisis, despite the fact uh, that Morris is a passionate uh, is a passionate supporter of Zionism, uh, um, for example. Um, um, I also um, uh, admire the work of, of Rashid Khalidi. I think he is kind of the. Um, I've actually been rereading re his work. Uh, uh, lately, and I think he um, he like Morris is is very passionate, has an ideology, but unlike some other Palestinian um, uh, commentators, he's able to confine, uh, he's able to have a scrupulosity about 
factual accuracy. So I would say those two gentlemen are, are uh, men I admire who write on the conflict. Now, I remember when I went to UCLA, I was studying economics and during an orientation, I was like holding forth with all sorts of views. And the advisor said, well, what you're describing are normative positions and that's kind of frowned upon in the economics profession. Now, you, fair and square, you have a lot of normative views on the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict. Is having normative views, meaning taking moral stands, is that is that in conflict with the profession of historian or is that a compliment to that profession? Um, I don't think it, it's either. I think it's something that you can you, you can do, um, but you have to subordinate your passion to the epistemic standards of history. You can't. Um, so, for example, I have a bias on the Palestinian side, right? I want to uh, vindicate the N Nakba narrative, but I can't vindicate it within the um, the typical framework of everybody was ethnically cleansed in 1948. There was a big plan for it because I don't believe there was there was a plan for it. I believe that Plan D or Plan Dalet uh, was uh, gave license for ethnic cleansing, gave permission, encouraged it, but didn't order it systematically. Uh, so, uh, but I do justify the uh, the narrative of of ethnic cleansing based on the of systematic ethnic cleansing based on the 1950 uh, Israeli uh, absentee property law, which took all the assets of the refugees they'd left behind and refused them a right of return. Uh, so I think you're going to be biased uh, based on the narratives you prefer, but you have to be subordinate to the facts. And to, for your overall question, I think advocacy is okay as long as you are a good liberal, a good Westerner, and <laughs> are subordinating your narrative to empirical reality. I would have no argument with describing the campaign that uh, Israel launched 1948, 49, 50, and going up to, to the present as ethnic cleansing. I think it's, it's fairly clear that the current government of, of Israel would like to ethnically cleanse Arabs from the West Bank and from the Gaza Strip, if at all possible. Do you have any quibbles with that? Oh, no, I think they surely want that. And I, I believe that uh, for the vast majority of Israeli history, there have been a couple exceptions. The the government has not been interested in a two-state solution, but has been interested in uh, the ideological project of, of greater Israel. And obviously, the Netanyahu government, which other than one year has been in power since 2009, um, that is their uh, interest. Now, if I were living in the Gaza Strip, if I was, say, a 17-year-old boy in, in, in living in the Gaza Strip, I mean, what exactly would I have to look forward to? Like, what would tempt me away from a path of pursuing terror against Israel? Right. Uh, I, very little, I think, um, particularly because um, Israel has uh, numerous occasions in the course of your very short life in this um, uh, circumstance you're outlining, launched uh, uh, murderous and indiscriminate attacks on civilians, on your, you know, your family and, um, and uh, your friends and so on. Uh, so I think that the, the, uh, a big cause without, uh, you know, we, we can't justify the fruits of the hatred massacre, but I think the hatred is very comprehensible. And if Israel is serious about, improving its security situation, it will address the hate, it will prioritize um, reducing the hatred over the Greater Israel Project. And I think these two things clash. We saw Netanyahu, there's videos circulating that Netanyahu says we have to support Hamas and other people on the Israeli right said that because they prioritized undermining politically the Palestinian image and therefore undermining the two-state solution. They prioritized that over security, right? Because if you want to improve your security, you would not <laughs> support Hamas. Uh, so I think there's a clash between, I think that the Israeli policy leads to this murderous hatred and uh, the murderous hatred leads to what we saw on 7 October and will likely lead to it in the future unless the policy uh, uh, changes. One side of your family comes from Egypt, is that correct? Are you guys e Egyptian mm -hmm. Christians? Tell me more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, 
so I have uh, relatives in the, yeah, my mom is an Egyptian Christian immigrant. My, I was raised with her and my grandparents and my uh, white father. <laughs> so interesting household. Uh, I went to Coptic church. Uh, sometimes I went to Catholic church. Uh, uh, sometimes I preferred Catholic church because it was shorter, but I have much more sentimental memories about Coptic church. I think that it was more godly an experience. I think uh, the Catholic church has gone a bit uh, politically correct and flabby. And then it also had the, the pedophilia uh, issue, uh, which was a, was a hammer blow to my uh, belief in the religion and my father's as well. But yeah, I mean, I definitely look, I mean, Egypt is one of the worst countries in the region for, for um, Christians. Like Jordan is much better. Lebanon is much better. But um, there was a poll, I think, where only 51% of Egyptians had favorable views of Christians. So um, there's a lot of negativity. But you're always going to view people who you consider, by and large, to be your co-ethnics as you know, the cops I've talked to. When push comes to shove, they do see whatever negative views they have toward Islam, and they often do. They do see the Egyptian Muslims as their co-ethnics. You're going to have sympathy for them and the Palestinians, for that matter, very closely related people. You're going to have sympathy for people like you, uh, regardless of whatever uh, theological or, or social uh, pressures push you away from them. Um, so that's that, yeah, that's part of my stance. And then also, I'm concerned about. I, I lived in the Near East for a couple of years. I'm concerned about uh, Palestinian friends of mine in Jordan, and uh, who have relatives in Gaza. And I'm also concerned about Egyptian family um, potentially being drawn into regional war. Although I think uh, if, if Hezbollah doesn't come in, that will be uh, a less likely occurrence than I had feared maybe um, <laughs> before a week ago. And what about your, your friends, your friends who care about the Middle East conflict? How do they line up? Well, um, in my program, I, I know I know an Israeli uh, who is, um, uh, I, I believe, uh, I don't want to characterize his views. Um, I do know Arabs uh, who are being a little quieter about what they think. Um, I think there is a, an environment of intimidation uh, that affects uh, Palestinian advocacy. I think it's gotten a little easier this week as opposed to a few weeks ago, but there is some constraints in what people feel comfortable saying because they don't want to be vilified as you're pro Hamas, you support rape and, and murder, which has been happening really glibly by, um, uh, by media and by the political right, ironically, because they're the people supposedly who have criticized this kind of thing when it came from uh, the left. So there's no strong slant on, on the part of your friends on this conflict. Oh, I think most of my friends are, are much more sympathetic to the Palestinians. I think uh, a number of them have been less outspoken because of uh, career implications, not wanting to be a student you're teaching, for example, you know, PhD students teach, right? Not wanting a student you're teaching to be, uh, feel offended. Um, so I think a lot of people who may be sympathetic to the Palestinians have been afraid to be too vocal about it. And if you were to, say, live in the Middle East for a year, which countries would you most like to live in for a year? Um, I would, I think, um, before, I think I, there, there's four I, I would uh, like, I would uh, be happy to live in. Um, Egypt, just because I have a lot of family. Um, that would be number one, just because of family. Uh, Lebanon, Beirut is a very fun city. It's, um, you know, <laughs> um, you, you can live a totally Western lifestyle there. You know, most of the Muslims are secular. Um, and most of the, you know, 30% or so are Christian of the population of Lebanon. Um, you, uh, I could live in Dubai quite easily. It's mostly expat and I know Arabic for the natives. And um, Jordan as well. Yeah, those would be four places I could I could live and teach, and I wouldn't mind doing that, provided my income were were adequate. <laughs> yeah. Okay, l let's uh, let's examine some some first principles because I've been doing a blog post on the principles by which I understand reality. And one of my foundational principles is that uh, essentially nobody cares about our groups. Now, for people like you and me who speak publicly we're not going to generally <laughs> display, you know, complete apathy or lack of empathy for our groups. 
but uh, people speaking privately generally tend to convey a, a lack of interest in the, in the welfare of our groups. I grew up an Australian, and there was a general feeling among my fellow Aussies that unless you're an Australian, you weren't fully human. You didn't really count. You weren't, you weren't much. And I just noticed that among all strongly identifying in-groups, and I would wish for everyone to enjoy the, the, the pleasures of belonging to a strongly identifying in-group, there is a strong tendency to have negative views of out-groups. So there are exceptions, particularly among intellectuals. I mean, the smarter you are, the more capacity you have for empathy, and so the more capable you are of feeling some empathy for out-groups. But as a general principle, the way the world works is that uh, most people don't care very much about foundation about how I view the world. Do you have any thoughts on this principle? Well, I think we've been, I think that uh, in-group preference is very powerful and that uh, the behavior of a lot of intellectuals has reminded us of how salient that is even among intellectuals in the West and so on, um, you know, some of the people I mentioned earlier in, in regard to this conflict um, and how they're, they're, they're emotionally driven, they're not engaged in rigorous commentary, even though they're quite capable of, of, of good analysis. I do, though, want to push back in part on what you're saying. You're definitely describing something very real and overwhelmingly powerful, but I do think humanity has made progress over the last few centuries in cultivating a greater compassion for the other. And I think this is, this spills over to uh, the public at large, not only um, uh, intellectuals or highly cultivated uh, minds. I think, you know, the abolition of slavery around, uh, you know, at least the old, <laughs> for, sorry about that, Luke. Uh, the abolition of slavery around the world, um, you know, it, um, movements against uh, human trafficking, for example, which are obviously going to be generally affecting foreigners, right? Um, these are there are strong indigenous movements against this in in various countries, not just the Western countries. Um, I think that various institutions that exist uh, exhibit the fact that there's more compassion for the other, for the traveler, for the person who looks different than there was. And I think we should keep moving in that direction. Nevertheless, we'd be fools to deny, as I think we often do, the overwhelming power that in-group preference still exercises on on how people think about the world and. A lot of people, I think, are being disingenuous by arguing that no, the only the reason I stand with Israel is just an expression of Western values or uh, sober political analysis. Clearly, they're emotionally driven and driven by identity issues. Yeah, almost all my friends are Orthodox Jews who tend to be quite right wing about uh, Israel, and so I'm reminded of the Jonathan Haidt observation that ties bind and blind, and. So I am I am blind to the Palestinian cause. I I just mm. I just am. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think about this notion that ties bind and blind? Of course they do. Um, one illustration of this, I think, is the fact that uh, quite understandably, people are horrified by these images of um, Palestinians celebrating uh, Seven October, right? Which are real images, right? In in in, in Gaza. But then they're celebrating or calling for, they're not just calling for support for Israel's uh, effort, which is, of course, based on their historical practice and, and the fact that like dozens of UN employees being killed and, and so on, um, the, the indiscriminate killing of civilians. They're not just cheering that, but they actually are, many are actually calling for genocide or war crimes or mass murder, including Israeli officials. So uh, yeah, they don't, uh, they see the savagery of the, of the, these people in Gaza cheering a woman being murdered and uh, with her body, uh, you know, her, her corpse is, is, is visible, but they are cheering for similar things and don't realize it um, because of, of, of this blinding effect that you referenced. Right. I'm not horrified by supporters of Palestine or critics of Israel who celebrated the Hamas attacks because I don't believe that overwhelmingly they were supporting the specifics of the Hamas attacks. They were supporting their team. And it seems like we are just mm -hmm. evolutionarily developed to instinctively root for our team and to 
make excuses for our team and to see everything through a filter that uh, favors our team. Any thoughts? I think you're right about that. I mean, I mentioned I mentioned Lebanon earlier. I mean, if you, you were to go to Beirut, you'd, you'd, you'd see people who, you know, other than looking a little different uh, in terms of physical appearance and ethnicity and racial background, uh, you know, mostly looking Western, right? Uh, most Muslims are secular, and then there's a bunch of Christians and Druze and so on. But among the Lebanese people, um, uh, polling indicates that the vast majority supported 7 October, including 60% uh, of Christians, 86% of Druze, and 98% of Shiite uh, Muslims. So, uh, and this is from this is um, uh, data from the Consultative Center for Studies and Documentation, which is a major research group in Lebanon, which the UN, um, you know, the UN cites. Uh, so it's quite credible. You know, so yeah, people are are lining up with their team, and they're not thinking about the ethical the ethical implications are a very distant second right um whereas the first it's my team struck a blow to um the other team it's humbling to realize how little americans for example care about the war crimes committed by americans you have the my Lai massacre around 1968 in vietnam where between 300 and 500 vietnamese civilians were, were murdered in the most horrific way and the architect, the director of that massacre, Lieutenant uh, William Calley, I believe, received four years of home <laughs> detention as, as punishment. And Americans really didn't care. Uh, and I, I don't think that's unique to Americans. I think that is the general human tendency. I don't expect Japanese to really care much about the war crimes committed by uh, Japanese. I don't expect the English to care much about the war crimes committed by the English. I don't expect Germans to care about war crimes committed by Germans. I don't expect Israelis to care about war crimes committed by Israel. Uh, can you think of some major exceptions to this where, where people in, in a nation are really, really upset about war crimes committed by members of their own team? Um, I think that this phenomenon of shame, which we see especially in the West, uh, tends to come more the more mainstream level after a conflict and cultural change have occurred. Whereas contemporaneously, you do see, so like in Germany, for example, you had the White Rose Movement that was talking about the shame of Germany. You even have some of this in the, in the, um, uh, in the July plot, uh, 1944, to uh, kill Hitler. But this wasn't a mainstream uh, sentiment until really in the 1960s um, uh, with the Eichmann trial, the Auschwitz trial, and then the 68 or kind of rebellion. Uh, so I think, I think you're actually right that this doesn't reach mainstream sensibilities until, uh, until a cultural change has occurred. Um, another example is the Sabra and Shatila massacre of, um, was it 82 or 83? 82. Um, it was 82. Thank you, Luke. Um, it, so this was carried out uh, by uh, the Lebanese Christian Falange uh, militia against uh, Palestinian refugees. Uh, the Israeli, the IDF, um, and I absolutely believe we can talk about this, but I absolutely believe uh, uh, knowingly on the part of Sharon, uh, the, uh, the Minister of Defense, uh, facilitated the massacre by letting the Falange into the refugee camp, guarding the exits, and also shooting flares into the sky to light the skies to carry out the massacre. There were Israelis who protested after the massacre, who protested the IDF and the government. But if you look at polling, like how much of the public was actually, um, you know, um, uh, angry with Sharon, only 4% uh, supported the commission, which called for his resignation, and the majority said it was too harsh. So I think, I think the general pattern is, um, yeah, there can be a, a culture of guilt, particularly in Western countries, this has happened uh, for past uh, crimes, but it's usually not contemporaneous with the war. With, Regard to Vietnam, though, I think that would be an exception on the American side because of there was very strong, um, not just fringe, but bourgeois moral opposition to the war and to things like my lie, which which actually did arise from our, our policies there because um, we had the free fire zones policy where because so much of the population, especially in rural areas, was against us and would shoot at us. Um, we would uh, we had curfews, and if you were out past a curfew, we um, shot you, shot anything that moved. Um, 
provide warning was given. And we ended up, I think, killing, according to Gunter uh, Levy, uh, you know, in a, in a considered work on the Vietnam War, we killed, I think, over 200,000 civilians this way and falsely labeled them as um, combatants. So, yeah, um, uh, we've done terrible things. And I think that with, with some exceptions, um, with, I think, the United States and other Western countries being among them, this guilt doesn't generally uh, accrue until after the war. While you're in the heat of the war, you're going to support your tribe. There's a, a great book on forgiveness called Forgive for Good by a professor at Stanford University, Fred Luskin, who leads something called the Stanford Forgiveness Project. And Fred Luskin's now in his 60s, and he won't work with groups where there's still an ongoing conflict. So he'll go work with people in Northern Ireland because there's been a political solution to that conflict. But he, he makes the, the point that there's just no reason to try to engage in forgiveness while there's still an ongoing conflict. Mm. Uh, unless there's a political solution, it's, it, it's not worth it. And he also would, would make the point in, in daily life that if you're fighting for your life in a dark alley, there's, there's no point in you know, having humanity and, and forgiveness for the person who, who's trying to kill you, that forgiveness is something that you need safety for. So the people of Gaza and the people of Israel, for varying reasons, don't feel much safety right now. So it would strike me as implausible to expect uh, either side to have a great deal of forgiveness for the other right now. Right. I mean, I'm sure you're right empirically that during an active conflict, uh, the idea of uh, forgiveness uh, or even um you know, excessive compassion for the other is going to be um, marginal, generally, depending on the society. I think if you have a very liberal, westernized society, you could have that, perhaps. But um, in general, I think I'm sure you're you're correct. I do think, though, that following these um, tribal impulses of vengefulness uh, can actually be against a group's interest, uh, paradoxically. Uh, for example, I think that the, strat the siege strategy Israel is employing right now is is a doomed strategy. The problem in Gaza is not the military potency of Hamas or the fact that it's some distinctive uh, specialized ideology, but the problem is you have a radicalized population, a lot of whom support killing Jewish uh, civilians, right? That's the underlying problem. And killing and maiming Gazans in, in colossal numbers is not going to de-radicalize them. They've been de-radicalized by being in an open-air prison where poverty is rife, where uh, food, extreme food insecurity is rife, where they score 18 points lower on IQ tests than, than Palestinians in the West Bank. Um, these are the material where, and where they've been subject to murderous uh, military campaigns and war crimes for, uh, for decades. Uh, these are the material conditions that are leading to the problem. And uh, a, a, a conquest of, of Gaza by ground is not going to which, I, by the way, I think is militarily unlikely to succeed anyway um, in terms of wiping out Hamas, is not going to liquidate the underlying problem, which is the, the hate uh, and support for violence uh, many Gazans have against Israelis. Now, another foundational principle I have is that, uh, that there really aren't essential peoples, like knowing that someone is Gazan or Palestinian or Arab or, or Jewish or Australian doesn't really tell you much, or Christian, you need to know more about them and how, you know, Gazans operate or how English operate or Australians or, or Jews operate depends a great deal on context and what type of Christian, what, what type of Jew. So some people who watch this will have the perspective that, oh, you know, Gazans or Palestinians are just inherently violent. Other people have the perspective that uh, Jews are just inherently uh, violent and, and bent on waging war. Uh, would you agree that there's no essential nature to to the Jew or to the Palestinian or to the Muslim that their tendencies, in all likelihood, you know, largely derive from the, the situation that they're in and the situation that they're coming from? Yeah, I agree. I emphatically agree with that. Um, so here, here's what I'd say. I think uh, for an individual with some very uh, particular exceptions like height, 
um, or intellect, right? Uh, that most of what we do, intellect would be an exception where there's a very strong genetic influence. Uh, but I think most of what we do is largely determined by our cultural circumstance. I mean, and, and for people who are, who are shocked by this, I mean, if, you know, people who were living uh, 300 years ago in the United States, uh, well, two, it didn't exist 300 years ago, but let's say 200 years ago, lived in a society where you, know, you got a slap on the wrist for raping your slave, for example. These people were, and I think the age of consent was like 10 to 12 or something like this. I read an interesting book about child marriage in the United States uh, recently, actually, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but the point is, I think our most, our core values, so let's say like the two most, the two things that people think are most repugnant uh, slavery and, uh, uh, you know, uh, child marriage um, are lawful in the past, right? People didn't have a big moral problem with it. So I think a lot of our moral intuitions are shaped by our particular cultural circumstances. But I think an exception uh, to this would be, um, uh, it, there are exceptions to this where genetics, I think, went out like intelligence. But generally speaking, I think how we behave is very much determined by uh, experiential and cultural factors rather than intrinsic properties of people. Right. I just, go ahead. Mm. Go ahead, look. Oh, oh, okay. I was just going to say for, from my own life, if I'm running late for an appointment, I am going to run roughshod over everything in my way. I am going to be brusque. I'm going to be lacking in empathy. I am going to put everything else aside to minimize the amount that I am late to an important appointment. So you just simply, let's say I'm late to give a speech on the importance of empathy. All right. I am going to be completely lacking in empathy. I'm just going to ride roughshod over everything in my way to try to get to my important speech on empathy on time. So simply being in that situation of running late for an important appointment makes me quite rude quite brusque, mm -hmm. uh, completely lacking in empathy. So too, I understand the behavior of Gazans and the behavior of Israelis is going to be significantly shaped by the amount of, of threat that they feel that they're under. Anything you want to add on this theme? I, I agree with that, but I think we can create cultural institutions, perhaps including a greater shame accorded to you for being a jerk and me i'm you know i do the same thing right uh and me for being a jerk if i'm uh, riding rush over people to get to class on time to teach on time or whatever um and you as well to give your speech and empathy i think we can create cultural incentives that train people to find the, the behavior you're describing repugnant um and I, I think we've done that to some extent right but to some extent in, in the West, maybe not regarding your specific example, but in other contexts, um, I think it's very difficult to do that when you're about to die a torturous death. Uh, so like Douglas Murray the other night tweeted these Gazans who are, who were, I think, watching uh, highlights with, obviously that term is escorted by scare quotes of 7 October, which, you know, very savage. Uh, but I mean, how are we going to deprogram these people when they're they're thinking these are the people who are about to kill me in a torturous fashion or my mother or sister or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, we should do it, but I don't know how you, you do it exactly. It's very difficult. There's a biologist who made an observation that in nature you don't find two subspecies in the same place, that one subspecies will inevitably win out over another species and drive, drive it out. Now, I don't think that's an iron law for how people have to behave because we can look around the world and even if you view different races as different subspecies, I, I can go to Sydney where there are all sorts of races, all sorts of diversity, and there's a very tiny rate of, of crime. So obviously different uh, subspecies can, can exist uh, together without uh, wiping each other out. At, on the other hand, I, I do understand that there's some... Uh, biological n primal uh, tension between different groups forced to live in the same place and some groups will get along better than other groups depending upon history context and and incentives but uh, do, you, do you recognize kind of the the primal uh, competition that is reflected among people that also we see in the in the non-human 
natural world where subspecies tend to go to war with each other over primacy in a particular place? Yeah, I think we have this impulse from uh, the lower animals, but I think we've, not just Westerners, but other peoples have overcome this to a fairly uh, striking extent in, in recent uh, centuries. I mean, you know, take the Palestinians, a lot of them want to kill uh, Jews, and all the Jews want to kill Palestinian civilians now, right, in, in Israel. But uh, if you look at Jordan, for example, same Palestinian population, um, mostly Palestinian rather, not entirely of a Jordanian minority, um, and they don't want to attack Christians. In fact, Christians are treated very well in Jordan by by regional standards, and just generally, I think they're treated well. I mean, they don't they're economically overrepresented. They're not attacked or discriminated against in uh, you know uh, in economic life. So um, yeah, I think it's quite possible. I think the world is moving more toward it. Nevertheless, I think we have to keep in view these biological drives. Uh, that are powerful and that become more powerful in moments of crises, uh, which we're seeing, as I say, in the West, like Nathan Kofnis is, um, is uh, very much engaged in, ident in the identity politics software right now. He, he doesn't think he is, but it's, it's obvious. I mean, he, he, um, he, he, he said an octopus is, is an anti-Semitic dog whistle, an octopus doll that this um, autistic Swedish left-wing girl, Greta Thunberg, uh, was displaying she he thought that was a dog whistle to nazi propaganda um and it's it's not because he's dumb or anything it's because he's he's very much on the identity politics software right now because he he sees his group as in a crisis which which they are right um so i think to give a, a kind of to split the baby in half there are strong biological drives and these become more powerful in times of crises how, how, for in-group uh, identification. However, I think that we've overcome them to a dramatic extent and not only in the West over the last uh, few centuries, especially. Now, would you say that Nathan Kofnis is more locked into the identity politics prism right now than you are? Um, yeah, I would actually. I think... Uh, I think I am uh, show. I mean, I, I want to debate Nathan. I want you to moderate it actually, because I think he, he's made just absurd, a series of absurd arguments. I don't think he, I think the problem he has is he doesn't. So I, I think I'm conscious of my bias and I don't think he is. I think he thinks he's, he, he's somehow um, uh, just expressing views. I mean, he told you, he doesn't think he's, he's biased. I think the reason his bias is allowed to run riot is because he hasn't, he doesn't even have the self-awareness to realize it. And um, yeah, so I think he's, he's because he's, he's less conscious of it. Um, his uh, the degree to which it perverts his ability to analyze the situation is, is, is far worse as, as in the octopus incident. Right. Um, he also was liking a, a tweet that was referring to a hate crime hoax, right? This, um, uh, this issue at uh, what's the name of the Cooper Union, where um, you know it, it, there was this claim that these Palestinian protesters were, were hunting Jews in the library. It turns out the vast majority of students in the library were not Jewish; um, that they were had no intention to harm anyone. They were just wanted to walk through the library and go to like the president, the university president, or so on uh, was their ultimate goal. So, yeah, he's basically falling for things in terms of really shoddy reasoning, hate crime hoax that he wouldn't be if he were, uh, weren't so uh, plugged into the identity politics uh, game. And I think, yeah, I think he's unaware of it. To, I mean, another example of this is he made just a terrible, so I, I cited, for example, I, in exchange with him, I cited the fact that over and over and over again, um, uh, the, that Israel in its uh, wars um, targets civilians indiscriminately, right? I cited, I cited various UN reports to this effect. And Kavnis responded by basically saying the UN is, is engaged in systematic racism because or systematic anti-Semitism because of um, uh, the UN General Assembly votes that are very targeted against Israel. But And then my thought was, hey, that doesn't make any sense. Sure, I I'd agree that there are, are states in the UN General Assembly that are biased against Israel, Arab states, and that may account for why there's so many votes against Israel, right? But the fact-finding missions that I was citing, like the Goldstone Report in 2009, have nothing to do with um, Arab states. So this is just a, a, a flimsy argument. You haven't drawn a connection between anti-Semitic Arab states and these UN fact-finding reports, which show overwhelmingly uh, uh, indiscriminate attacks on civilians. 
and then he just got mad at me and you know um, said I'm unserious and so on. Um, I, I really want to debate him on this because I think his knowledge is very uh, superficial. Would you would you host it, Luke? Um, oh, absolutely. I've I've reached out to him. I'll do my best to try to arrange it. I I saw a comment or something like that you're a troll and you're not. That's that's not the best description for you. I mean, we all have trollish aspects to ourselves, but what what you're doing is not primarily trolling. Right, and remember, he 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 wanted to debate Eric Stryker. So, um, if if he, the claim is I'm unserious, he, he'd have to believe not only that, but that I'm less serious than Stryker for that to be a consistent criterion. So, no, I, I again, I think that would be a case too of of um identity politics driving the you know driving the show for him but i hope he changes his mind and uh, just if you're listening to this nathan i'd be willing to do a no ad hominem rule or or you know obviously luke would prevent interruption but i think we should debate i think our, our viewers would would benefit from the from it i often hear it said that uh, israel is the only democracy in the middle east do you think that's fair and accurate um, well, Lebanon has a uh, Lebanon has a democracy that you know they have um, elections. People um, you know vote uh, within the confessionalist framework. Uh, there are elections, so I think I think Lebanon would would constitute a democracy. Um, now, it doesn't mean Lebanon has a <laughs> remarkably liberal uh, system, but I, nor does Israel. And Israel, I would call a democracy too. So. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't accept that, and I don't think. By the way, I don't think it matters that much. <clears throat> I think. A, I think a, a dictatorial society could be better than a democracy in some circumstances. Uh, for example, I like the direction. Uh, in, I mean, he's a murderer and has done horrible things to people, but nevertheless, uh, Mohammed ibn Salman um, is moving Saudi Arabia in a better direction. He's um, marginalized radical clerics. He has given women more rights women can now live on their own they can leave the country on their own um he's improved the the, the situation it's still bad for uh foreign uh, workers and he's kind of opening you know the relaxed address code the concerts and movies and you know he's moving the country in the right direction and he wouldn't be able to do it in a democratic system as easily right um so i think that would be a case where positive reform can be made by a dictator, right? Um, on the other hand, there are advantages to democratic system too. There, so the horrible things MBS does, um, torture, murder, would be more difficult to get away with in a system with um, divided um, uh, institutions. Although, of course, Israel committed torture systematically for many years until 1999. They're a democracy. So, yeah, I think I think it matters that Israel is a democracy, um, which is rare in the region. I think I'd call Lebanon one too, but. Um, I don't think that is a, as powerful a talking point as one might think. Now, another foundational principle I have for understanding the world is I'm, I just don't see many examples of strong in-group identity that doesn't substantially also have a strong victimhood identity. It seems like hmm. in-group identity depends upon victimhood identity. There's no strong Jewish identity. There's no strong... Uh, Christian identity, the, the, to the best of my knowledge, there's no strong Muslim identity, to the best of my knowledge, mm -hmm. without an accompanying victimhood identity. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting point. I, I think I, I'm, I'm I'm very tempted to say that you're exaggerating, but I think that you've made a very interesting point that victimhood. We we, we sometimes talk about victimhood as if it's a contemporary phenomenon that the West fetishizes victimhood, but in fact. A notion of, of uh, you know, the kind of heroic epic where the hero is victimized and then rises and becomes powerful and, and, and smites his oppressors. This is um, this has broad cultural resonance. And you even have a case of, of like Nazi Germany, for example. Right. You know, uh, they had a victimhood narrative from Versailles. You have the, the Soviet Union that has a victimhood narrative of the uh, oppression of the uh, proletariat under the the hated SARS. So I think I think a, a, a victimhood narrative is very this is very powerful and consistent source of identity. I wouldn't say it's the only source of identity though. Um, 
but it, it does seem like groups very quickly go to that. Um, even even groups that you'd think of as, as privileged, uh, like the Gulf Arabs, for example, they, they will go to is, Islamophobia or whatever, um, if need be. And that will be a unite unifying mechanism. So I think you've pointed to a, a very interesting um, uh, group uh, dynamic, which, which very much strengthens the group dynamic, a sense that one has been victimized. Maybe not that one is victim now, victimized now, but one has been victimized and one is in some kind of spiritual sense still a victim. Because, of course, if you were a victim at one point, you're powerful and mighty now. That makes you a hero, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and there was a very strong sense of uh, victimhood among my, my fellow Seventh-day Adventists. Like, I was raised on books like uh, Fox's Book of, of Martyrs, which describes tens of millions of Protestants being murdered mm -hmm. by by catholics and, and i remember my, my father when i was on my journey to judaism said that you know what the what the catholics did to the protestants made the you know the holocaust look like child's play mm -hmm. and uh, i mean that's that's a dominant ethos in seventh day adventism i heard like 20 times more negative things about catholics growing up than i did about jews i i checked with my siblings we didn't once have a conversation about jews when I was growing up in my Seventh Day Adventist, you know, theologian father's uh, home. It, it was all about how uh, Catholics had had victimized us. So that once you have this strong sense of victimhood, which seems to be empirically, you know, everywhere you have strong sense of in group identity. What what always accompanies that is is a predisposition towards a lack of moral inhibition in overcoming that perceived victimhood. And I'll give you an example. I reacted very strongly against Donald Trump and Republican claims that the 2020 elections were rigged by, by the Democrats, that it was a, a stolen election. And one of the arguments I put forward is, if you believe this, if you believe the 2020 elections were stolen, then there are no longer any moral inhibitions. Like You can do anything once you believe that the 2020 elections are stolen. And so what accompanies a strong sense of victimhood is usually a strong in-group identity, which has many beautiful parts to it, but also what accompanies a strong in-group identity and a strong sense of victimhood is a complete, complete lack of, of moral inhibitions with how you redress this perceived victimhood. Any thoughts? I agree. I think that the greater the perceived level of victimization i mean you even you even see this with uh with with, with black lives matter so um in 2020 of course we had riots that where a lot of people died in, in in arson for example a lot of people were burned alive right um and this was justified because of the the sense that african americans have been so victimized that these murderous uh often murderous not always of course but 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 uh, often murderous uh, protests or riots were the expression of this victimization. So, yeah, I think people, uh, not just by any means, not just the African American community in America, but all, all kinds of communities, um, you know, in Europe and the U.S. and uh, the Middle East, will relieve themselves of moral inhibitions if they think that uh, they have been oppressed enough. That that justifies. Uh, this kind of outrageous behavior. And I think I'm, I'm sure you're seeing that in Gaza and you're also seeing that frankly in Israel, because you, you, you're seeing people call for genocide and call for, you know, not deliberately not discriminating between civilians. And I mean, you even have Herzog talking about how there are no civilians in Gaza essentially. So yeah, I think, I think the, the sense of a group being victimized, which may be true, of course, to some extent um, leads to more outrageous and, uh, murderous uh, expressions of of um, outgroup hostility. So uh, Admiral Bill Halsey was a big uh, favorite of the press and of many of his uh, soldiers, members of the U.S. Navy during World War II, for his attitude towards the enemy. And his war strategy was summed up in th this one sentence: "The way to win the war is to kill Japs, kill Japs, and kill more Japs." Uh, that. Mm -hmm does seem to be a dominant attitude of, of people in war, particularly when they feel like they've been victimized. So Israel certainly feels victimized by 
October 7, Palestinians feel victimized by their living conditions over the past uh, 70 years. And so I would kind of expect this attitude to be to be huge among both groups. The, the way to win the war is to kill the enemy. Right. But you have to, at some point, be rational and think, sure, I mean, there's um, certainly some impulse there, but I, I think Israelis have fallen prey to this to such an extent that they're not embracing the kind of uh, military or political strategy that actually will prevent this kind of thing from happening again. I mean, as I say, the, the major problem in Gaza is not <laughs> the brilliance or military power of Hamas. I mean, these are like a bunch of ragtag thugs. The problem is that there are tens of thousands of these Hamas fighters. And why are there? Because they hate, because the people of Gaza hate the Jewish Israelis by and large, right? Um, and you're not going to solve that by this bloody, um, uh, vicious uh, siege and, and indiscriminate targeting of civilians. And, and they have a, a history of doing this. I mean, in 2021, you know, when they were, uh, 2021 um, airstrikes on Gaza, air wars found that 70% were that killed civilians, 70% of the strikes that killed civilians had no, killed no militants or military targets. So Israel has a history of doing this. They seem to be more extreme even uh, now. And I think it'll lead to more hatred and in the long run to a worse security condition for them. Even if they ethnically cleanse the Gazans to Egypt, you're still going to have a problem on your on your border. I mean, that's what led to the Israeli invasion of, of, of Lebanon that, uh, you know, culminated with the Sabra and Shatila massacre. So they're going to this is not going to improve the security situation. Um, and another reason is like the victimization narrative and also, you know, the, the real suffering, of course, all the people who had relatives massacred or kidnapped have, right? They're not, it's not just a narrative, it's a fact. Um, this I think is blinding them to how do we actually, to the likelihood of this happening in the future. I mean, this was a preposterous uh, security uh, breach I mean, they need to fortify their border. It's ridiculous. The, the, how, how did these people with paragliders get across the Israeli border? It's just ridiculous. I mean, all the all the people in the security apparatus should be fired immediately. You know, it's so. So, I, in other words, I don't think there's. I think it, these impulses of, of victimhood, however true they are, uh, are blinding the Israelis in this case to what would actually be good policy to prevent this from happening again. Because the Palestinians are going to keep engaging in terrorism so long as they're treated like this. It's just going to, that's just what's going to happen. Now, maybe this this expression of it was more brutal than we had thought, but the terrorism in and of itself shouldn't surprise anyone. That's that's what they're going to keep doing. So I, I heard one comment that the news media in the United Kingdom has become even more pro-Israel than the news media in the United States. Do you have any sense about this? I have noticed that like publications such as the guardian, which is like, you know, left kind of woke, not far left, not leftist, but like left liberal, um, has become more pro Israel. They even fired a cartoonist. Um, they even fired a cartoonist for caricaturing Netanyahu in a way. I don't think it was anti-Semitic at all. Um, I try to look this story up and I could DM it to you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they sacked a, a, a cartoonist who worked there for decades because he caricatured Netanyahu. So yeah, I think I think the the British establishment, including the mainstream media like BBC and and uh, the Guardian, have become much more pro um, Israel. I do think though that there is um, a lot of this is top down in the United States and in Britain now. I'm not. I think most of the public would support Israel right now, but I, I also believe that there's a lot more more dissent than. Uh, is being indicated by uh, the media and by public officials, right? And I think that the dissent will continue to grow as people learn more about Israel and also see the radically indiscriminate targeting of civilians. I mean, we, we talked about Vietnam earlier, and yeah, in Vietnam, you know, we killed we killed hundreds of thousands of civilians, and as I say, the free fire zones. But we have evolved though beyond since Vietnam uh, beyond this kind of uh, indiscriminate targeting of civilians. Like in Iraq, for example, I get the exact figures. Um, Iraq body count. Oh, I'm looking at a tweet I did on this. Oh, the, the, yeah, there are various numbers, uh, uh, tens of thousands right, to so, a million no, no. people died as a result of the 
2003 invasion. Sure, sure. Well, a million is probably a little high, but many hundreds of thousands died. But the coalition, but the one thing that's not talked about in this connection is that the the coalition uh, between 2003 and 2010, um, according to Iraq body count, so we're not talking like a shill pro-American source, killed 13,807 civilians total. Um, Obviously, the total civilian death was way higher, but most of that was caused by the people we were fighting. It wasn't caused by us. That's just a fact. I mean, it's leftists often say, oh, we killed a million people in Iraq. Killed. No, it, we killed, you know, uh, the, between 20, 2003 and 2010. There's a little more data there from the end, but thirteen about a little under 14,000 civilians. Israel's going to pass that in like some little strip of land the size of Chicago, probably by the end of the year. So uh, we do not target civilians nearly as indiscriminately as Israel uh, as Israel does. Um, they're really, they're completely out of the Western mainstream. We know what they do. I mean, in, 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 in Cass Lead, for example, in 2008, 2009, um, uh, the United Nations found 90% of deadly attacks on civilians had no articulable military justification, whatever. I mean, they, they do this all the time. And this is a big reason why they're hated uh, indiscriminately killing. So I'm not saying indiscriminately killing civilians is um, the same as, as what Hamas did, but we're, we're getting in the neighborhood of, of murder here, you know? Um, and, and no, the United States doesn't in the past we did, but we don't uh, target civilians so indiscriminately anymore as, as Israel does. And that's part of why um Biden is, is having cold feet. And I remember there, there's a Senator who's supportive of Israel who's starting to have cold feet too. I mean, they've killed like, dozens of UN aid workers. They're not, they bombed a refugee camp or a na whatever you want to call it, neighborhood. Residential, people are mad about that term, but it doesn't really matter much what we call it. Uh, and I think, again, uh, this is going to lead to more hatred um, of, and I think this is part of the problem they have, that uh, the, by indiscriminately killing civilians, you know, people are going to hate you, right? Um, and so which nations say wedging a war for what they regard as their, their own survival, would you regard their conduct as more exemplary than, than Israel's? Well, I mean, you, the, the, the key qualifier you put in there is waging for own survival. So that would, that would open a, a can of worms. That may be why they're more, um, look, okay. So that could be the reason why they're more indiscriminate, but if we're just raw, if we're just comparing rawly, like the United States and Iraq to Israel, the U.S. and Iraq is much less indiscriminately killing. So like they killed, you know, um, um, many more, far more, about twice as many more militants as civilians. Israel's killing, <laughs> kills far more civilians than militants in these, in these, um, in these exchanges, um, like in Cast Lead, in 2008-2009 Protective Edge. Um, by the way, Protective Edge, 40% of cases there were uh, where civilians were killed, there were uh, no explanations uh, the United Nations found for, for why this happened. Um, like not, we're not talking about a good one or a bad one or disproportionate, like zero. So this is like a long-term practice of Israel's. Now, you may have, have highlighted the motive that they feel existentially threatened in a way America doesn't. Fair enough. Uh, first, I'd say they're wrong. Um, that Hamas did massacre all these people, but Ham Hamas is not a military threat to Israel. Ham Hamas is a terrorist threat to Israel. It's the idea that these people could defeat Israel militarily and de defeat the state of Israel is a joke. What they could do is murder innocent Israelis and torture innocent Israelis as they did. And um, the current tactic being used against them is not going to disincentivize them from doing that. It's going to incentivize them to do it. Um, so, what I would say to your question is, yeah, you may have identified the the cause of of why they're 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 so much more indiscriminate than Western nations like America. But first of all, it's not true. Uh, they're wrong to think that they're existentially threatened. They're threatened by terrorism. And second of all, um, it's making the problem worse. This perception and this practice. So Israelis would say that this Hamas attack has rendered life in southern Israel next to Gaza impossible and so tens of thousands of israelis have had to be evacuated and so that is their perspective on the existential threret that you know mm -hmm. a, a significant portion of their country is now uninhabitable due to this attack uh what do you think of that reaction no i don't think it is um i would do i would do the same if i were israeli i'm not trying to diminish their sense of facing a security risk what i'm saying is 
Hamas doesn't pose a an existential threat to the existence of the state of Israel. It's just way too weak. Israel's way too strong. What it does pose is a threat of terrorism, and people on the border after a massacre are going to be horrified of that, and very understandably. I'm not saying they're acting irrationally. Yeah, I mean, I think we both agree that if you know, for some un, unthinkable reason Mexico made life uh, unsafe for people in the southwestern part of the United States, so California, Arizona, Texas, no longer New Mexico, no longer livable, and you know tens of millions of Americans had to move out of those states. Americans would regard that threat as an existential threat. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, if if there were a massacre of 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 you know uh, a thousand American civilians and a few hundred soldiers died, or whatever the figures are, um, well, I don't know what the figures are. Over a thousand civilians, let's say, we'll know we'll know numbers. I'm sure after the fact and as it's investigated with more precision, but. Um, yeah, it would be totally rational and human to move away from the border completely. I'm not. I'm not deprecating that. What I'm. What I'm saying is, it wouldn't be rational to think that the existence of America is threatened by, uh, let's say, some gang that commits a massacre. Right. Um, right. But if California became unlivable, just California, if California became sure. unlivable, um, that would be experienced by Americans, even though it's only California. But if California, one state in the union, became unlivable, th that would be experienced by Americans as an existential threat to its existence. Yeah, sure, but it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be well if it became unlivable because there is a terrorism threat, and like the woke people won't enforce the law if people murder or rape. Or is that hypothetical? But because just, I don't know how. Just I mean, transferring they, they, what happened to southern Israel to the okay. southern United States, but we'll just okay. limit it to one state. California becomes unlivable because there's such a powerful terror group in, in mm -hmm. northern Mexico. And so 40 million Californians move out of the state because the United States, for whatever reason, lacks confidence that it can defend its citizens in California even though it's only one state out of 50, that would still be experienced by Americans as an existential threat, even if there is absolutely no chance that this powerful terror group in Mexico is going to be able to overcome the United States as a total uh, militarily. Sure. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not deprecating the reaction of Israelis in the South. I, I, I bet I'd do the same thing if I were Israeli. What I am saying is that for people engaged in political or military analysis, it is very important to understand what exactly the threat is. And the threat is one of terrorism, not of some military power akin to Nazi Germany that we need to liquidate, right, uh, to defeat. It, 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 and, and the terrorism arises from a radicalized population. They're going to keep they're going to keep supporting terrorism against Israelis until they until they're let out of their open air prison, until they have a, a state. They're going to be continual uprisings, terrorism, uh, outrages, uh, murders. So it's just the wrong approach to conceive of it as militarily. It doesn't mean that, and, and to conceive of it as this existential military threat rather than a terrorist problem. It doesn't mean it's not a big deal or that people are irrational to be afraid and move away and outraged. So I often hear the description of Gaza as an open air prison. And I, my, my view is that that's moderately hyperbolic, but that it touches on important truths. However, I think if we were to survey people living in a actual high security prison and say you can continue living in a high security prison or you can live in Gaza, I, I wonder, would, would most of them? So I, I would regard Gaza as an open air prison, just uh, moderately hyperbolic. Uh, would you would you say, yeah, it's it's clearly literally true because most people in a high security prison in the United States would not you know, take the opportunity to live in Gaza instead of being in a high security prison. Talk to me more about that description of Gaza as an open air prison. Well, I think I would prefer to live in, assuming I, I knew I'm not going to get uh, assaulted, you know, to use a euphemism. Um, there are prisons in America I think I'd prefer to live in than, than uh, uh, Gaza, given the risk of death in Gaza, not just right now, but over the years given the lack of clean drinking water, given the, the extreme poverty and, and food insecurity. No, I don't. I mean, they can't leave. 
um, there was this this blockade uh, preventing them from engaging in, in, in open air in, in open commerce. Of course, the the cutting off of waterways and, and blockades this is like considered under international law a cause of war. Um, that should be noted. It isn't a cause of massacre, of course, but it's a it's a it's considered a just uh, cause for war. Um, so no, I, I don't think it's hyperbolic. I mean, right now it's kind of like. <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, the, the, one of the most striking pieces of data which Richard Lynn has found is that Gazan children are 18 points lower in IQ tests than West Bank children. I mean, that shows a level of, and and Lynn is no politically correct actor. He he believes this is a this is an environmental explanation, which which makes sense because they're the same people. Like the Gazans are mostly not from Gaza; they're ethnically cleansed elsewhere in the Nakba and ended up there, uh, and their descendants. Um, so I think I think the material conditions as as evidenced by poverty rates, by food insecurity rates, by rates of anemia among children and and uh, pregnant women, um, and uh, lack of clean water, and of course the the periodic uh, killings uh, and maimings of these people at very high levels. No, I think I think God, if if I knew that I'm not going to be like sexually assaulted, I think I'd prefer an American prison. And and also like, I know I'm not being falsely accused of some crime. Like I'm not being told I'm a murderer. Right. Um, but if I just have like some. Desperately living year... conditions. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You could, you can have, you can make love. You can, you can uh, do all sorts of things in Gaza that you can't do in, in prison. You can make love to a woman in Gaza. I think it'd be a lot harder in prison. Sure. But there's also, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to die, die a torturous death in Gaza, as we're seeing right now. I mean, and have your family die a torturous death. You know, a lot of, a lot of I think it would depend on the prison. If you're in a Swedish prison, that's better than Gaza. Um, I mean, yeah, sex would be one thing that you can do in Gaza that you couldn't. That's so that's that's an important difference. But I don't think open air prison is um is hyperbolic, really. Um, there also can be conjugal visits in prison, um, but yeah. So, anyway, I, I think I don't think it's hyperbolic because they can't yeah. leave. I mean, okay. they're, they can't leave. I mean, David yeah. Cameron called it an open air prison. Mm -hmm. um, you know, conservative British Prime Minister pro Israel. He's he's called it that. Uh, it's, it, I think it's a reasonable analogy. I mean, and, and and you could even say it's worse than a prison in the sense that the people are all stuck in prison. There's due process and so on, and you're you're convicted of a crime and you're there. Usually a pretty serious crime. If you're a first time offender and you did something bad but not horrible. You're usually not going to go to prison, but um, these people are all. Uh, are, there's many innocent people who've done nothing wrong who are just in this prison because of their of dint of birth. So, you could argue it's much worse. Than, it's internment camp. I think would be a would be an appropriate even concentration camp. Although, concentration camp, the problem is it has the extermination camp um, connotation, which is not well maybe accurate in the future, but isn't accurate has not been accurate in the past. But. Um, the uh, but it kind of is a concentration camp or internment camp in the historical sense of those terms, right? It, it, if you look at like for example how the, what the British did to the Germans during World War II, it does look a lot like that. I mean, there were camps where in India, British India, where I've stayed, where there were families who could live together. So you could you could if you're a Nazi and and you had a family and kids, you could see your kids and have sex with your wife in the internment camp. But it was still an internment camp or concentration camp, right? Um, in in uh, India, right? But you didn't get to vote for your uh, political overseers, I would assume, in the internment camps. But the Gazans did have an opportunity to vote in two thousand six. They voted for Hamas. Uh, apparently, how much of the, the misery in Gaza is the responsibility of Gazans? I think very little, because um, I think. Uh, it depends on what you're talking about. So I think the people who voted for Hamas do have a responsibility, but I would say the overall responsibility is little because of the fact that the vast majority of people in Gaza didn't. They either weren't born, weren't old enough, or didn't vote for Hamas, which just went a, a, a plurality. Um, so I think, uh, not. I don't think very little would be a little too strong, but I think it would be pretty modest, the level of responsibility they have. By the way, remember that the... The big uh, kind of propaganda line used um, to uh, vilify the Palestinian cause is that the um, um, 
the uh, that in 2005 Israel removed all the settlements and was making a serious gesture for peace. Remember who the Israeli leader was at the time? It was Ariel Sharon, who in 1953 in Libya um, committed a massacre, literally committed a massacre. And um, people don't know this, but literally committed a massacre. I'm not talking about Sabra and Shaquille. I'm talking about a massacre which he which is unit one one carried out of Palestinians. So he, this guy is massacre. He's a massacre man. He's massacred Palestinians. In 1982, he, as compelling evidence shows, uh, which we could talk about if you wish, uh, he knew about and facilitated the Sabra and Shatila massacre. I'm not saying he knew about scale or all the details, but he knew in general terms that, that they were uh, murdering people. Um, and th this man was always against a two-state solution um, um, ideologically through his whole career. The idea that he just changed at the end is implausible. This was obviously a, a, a propagandistic game he was playing to try to create the talking points. First of all, he thought Gaza was not worth the security risk. But the second thing is he um, he, he believed that uh, this would be a, a good talking point. I mean, a lot of the settlers that he kicked out of Gaza were then moved to the West Bank. So it wasn't as if he had given up the Greater Israel Project. Um, uh, but in terms of your question, no, I think the, for the large majority of the c citizens of Gaza, there isn't responsibility because they simply didn't vote for Hamas. They didn't, um, uh, they weren't alive. Um, or they, they may have done so in just a state of total ignorance where they didn't know the much about the program um, and, and so on. Um, the people in Hamas who carried out a massacre, yeah, they have, they have responsibility or people who are corrupt and swindling the public there. Yeah, they have, a, they definitely have a responsibility for it, but I think most don't look when you're, when you're totally controlled by by another power, as Gaza is, I mean, they're they're blockaded. Israel uh, controls everything that goes in. They just control the economy essentially. If you control all imports in the modern world, there's not um, autarky and <laughs> autarky is not a viable model for Gaza. So Israel basically controls the economy, controls uh, the society. Then yeah, Israel has the primary responsibility for what's going on there. And if they don't want that, then they should support a Palestinian state. If they don't want to take that responsibility, then support a Palestinian state. It's not that difficult. If you're going to be the the colonizer or controller of an area, you need to take responsibility for it. If you don't want to do that, then give them independence. So th there's no controversy that uh, Hamas rules Gaza. I don't see anyone disputing that. Uh, to what extent are Gazans responsible for Hamas ruling Gaza? Why, why are they so weak or ineffectual that they can't overthrow a, a regime that is inimical to their own welfare? Well, I mean, if you look at polling, Hamas is pretty unpopular in, in Gaza. Even most of the poll by the Washington Institute, which is pro-Israel, by the way, showed a majority were against breaking the, the ceasefire too. So uh, the inference that most of them supported the massacre, I think, is wrong. Although I think they're clearly we, we we've, we've seen expressions of support, so they exist, right? I'm not saying there aren't popular support. I think that um, I mean, sure, they could have a coup d'état and overthrow the Hamas. I, I, it's very difficult to do that when you don't have access to weapons, um, you know. Uh, as a society because of the blockade obviously is i'm not saying israel should allow weapons in there even i wouldn't right and i'm very pro-palestine but um you know the, the hamas have the weapons right um and the regular people do not and there are tens of thousands of fighters so and you have a you have a much more salient enemy in israel so i just don't think there's going to be a a strong popular movement to fight hamas i think that's an unrealistic expectation and you know, generally in history, when you have authoritarian regimes or totalitarian regimes or oppressive regimes, people do not, there are not successful coup d'etats that overthrow them. Um, and those that do arise are, are generally fairly special circumstances with foreign help uh, and, and so on. Um, so, no, I don't I don't hold them deeply uh, responsible for not overthrowing uh, Hamas. Um, people who voted for Hamas do have uh, responsibility. But by the way, um, you probably know this, but the... There are many people in the Israeli right, including Netanyahu, who said we have to support Hamas because they they undermine the optics of the national Palestinian movement. We can't support the the PA because the PA, since the Second Intifada, has denounced violence, and the West would be willing to negotiate with them. So we can't make them more powerful. We have to make Hamas more powerful. So there's a responsibility on the Israeli government too because they wanted to empower this group. 
and undermine their security in the process uh, for the sake of uh, destroying the Palestinian cause and preventing a two-state solution and pursuing the greater Israel project. So I think Israel has a lot of responsibility too, not not Israelis, but the government officials who supported uh, Hamas. So since COVID, I, I've become increasingly discouraged by the low intellectual quality of most right-wing discourse. Mm -hmm. And one example is the widespread contempt on the right for virtue signaling. I, I just simply read mm -hmm. a paper by a philosopher making the argument virtue signaling is virtuous. And I read it and go, yeah, of course, like signaling plays a huge role in nature. Like animals are constantly signaling to each other. Why would not people signal to each other? And is it not better for people to signal something virtuous than something, you know, non-virtuous? And so virtue signaling, I just suddenly became convinced is, is a good thing. Now, it, it's complicated in this war with Israel in, in Gaza because it strikes me that a large part of the conflict between, say, Israel and Hamas is about signaling. Uh, Israel must signal to its enemies that this kind of destruction is what awaits you if you hurt us. If you attack us, we're going to be you know, brutal to you just as we are in, in Gaza right now. Also, Israel was able to obtain uh, peace treaties with various other Arab Middle Eastern nations over the past three years because it essentially signaled that we are here to stay, that we have the most powerful military in the Middle East. And so if Israel is as incompetent as it appeared on October 7, then Arab states are strongly not incentivized to make treaties with Israel because it doesn't look like Israel's going to last if it is indeed as incompetent as it was on October 7. But at the same time, Hamas must signal that it's fighting for the cause of the Palestinian people, that it's not a, a paper tiger. So it seems to me that a large part of this Israel versus Hamas conflict is a matter of signaling, and that is what's driving much, perhaps most of the brutality on both sides. Any thoughts? Um, so can you repeat the question uh, in a little more concise? So you're talking about is signaling. virtue signaling yeah. driving? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Signaling. It's, it's like, not so much virtue signaling. It's maybe it's the opposite. Mm. It's, it's power signaling. Mm -hmm. Israel mm. needs to signal mm. that it's here forever mm -hmm. and that anyone who attacks it will be, will, will bear the brunt of its fury. And this is driving the fury of the Israel response because it needs to signal and what drove Hamas's attack on October 7th, in large part, was a need to signal something that it's not a paper tiger, that Israel is not here forever, that Israel is vulnerable, that Israel can be defeated, that uh, Muslims and Arabs can unite to drive out the Zionist occupier. And so th they're both engaged in signaling, and that's a significant part of the brutality. Of of course, signaling is is politically very relevant. I would never deny that. Um, the problem is when your signaling gets in the way of 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 sound policy and core issues like security. I, I think, as I say, I don't think the Israeli military effort is going to succeed in destroying Hamas, and I don't think even destroying Hamas would really accomplish that much because another group is going to take up uh, the same kind of ideological banner. And violent and support violent um, extremism and murder of Israelis because of the fact that you're going to have a population full of maimed people and widows and orphans and you know the the, the sense of hatred will be far stronger. Uh, the problem is a de-radicalized population and yeah, I think definitely there's a signaling process going on. Netanyahu wants to say, if, and frankly, the political such situation in Israel is such that if somebody said, let's, as I proposed the other day. If Hamas agrees to um, give up every um, uh, hostage, we'll have a ceasefire. Um, if you were to say that in Israel, you get lynched. You have to say, um, no, we support totally destroying Hamas no matter what, right? Um, so I think that you're right about the role of signaling in politics and in and, and human psychology, but it isn't a good thing right now. It's a bad thing in the context of Israel. Um, actually, Hamas... Um, as brutal and cruel as they are, may have had a better uh, strategy because uh, maybe their strategy was with by being as brutal as possible and medieval as possible to provoke uh, Israeli war crimes and killings of civilians and 
killings of aid workers and so on at a level we haven't seen uh, for a long time. And therefore, to get more Arab uh, support for Israel, uh, pardon me, for the Palestinian cause, and even, frankly, uh, Western support for the Palestinian cause. So um, it could be that Hamas is acting strategically while Israel is signaling. Now, when I started live streaming almost every day in early 2018, I, I've found a, a strategy which I'd already arrived at through my, my blogging, but it really served me well in 